So today we're happy to have Kev, uh, Kev Orkoff is on here, just like Kev for short. He's hoping us as a unit named after him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so now I told a joke and I lost my brand. So, uh, okay, so, so Kev writes, so Kev, um, uh, he's currently faculty uh, at UC Irvine. Um, he started out his uh, academic career at, um, actually I've known Kev a long time. Actually I've known Kev longer than he's actually, that's a true statement because when I was a student I read his papers when he was a postdoc. Uh, so Kev um, got his PhD from San Diego, I'm going to guess 2000-ish, okay. um, uh, from uh, George Fuller, uh, working on neutrino astrophysics and sort of laying the groundwork for a lot of what he's going to talk about here today. Uh, from there, he moved on to a uh, postdoc at Fermilab, uh, worked in lots of cosmology topics, got involved in Sloan at that point. Okay. Um, uh, so then he moved to another postdoc at Los Alamos. Uh, and uh, so, uh, after that, he got a faculty position at the University of Maryland, was there for a few years, but was well sought after, so uh, moved to uh, sunny Southern California a few years ago, um, uh, where he's been ever since. And uh, so Kev, again, has a sort of wide expertise in lots of areas of cosmology, astro particle physics. Um, one of, certainly one of the leaders, if not the leader, uh, in theory of um, uh, sterile neutrino dark matter uh, production mechanisms, uh, sort of the cosmology of this field. So he will uh, talk about some exciting new observations uh, that are going on in this field, as well as some exciting theory. So, uh, with that introduction, let's go, Kev. It's okay. Thanks, Louis. Uh, it's nice to visit here. I've never, I, I have been to Texas A&M before. It was in 1993. I was an undergrad at the University of Houston, and I had fellow high school friends that went to Texas A&M as opposed to UT. Um, that was the two places people went, and I was an outlier going to UH. Um, Anyway, all I remember from that trip that, that you could get a pitcher of beer for a nickel. <laughs> <laughs> my age didn't really matter for me. Uh, uh, um, so, uh, so it's nice to visit. I, I know uh, the, a few of the people here. Um, and, uh, nice to uh, visit here. Uh, all right, so, um, so I'm going to talk about these uh, the implications of the dark matter uh, K line uh, at three and a half kV potential dark matter K line. Um, and uh, uh, this is a picture that was actually made for the uh, uh, physics viewpoint that I wrote uh, uh, came out in December um, about these uh, uh, potential detections and uh, how it could be due to uh, uh, a certain kind of dark matter can be called a sterile neutrino. If it's a sterile neutrino, we know that it has to have uh, uh, certain properties. Here's an actual, there's a lot of evidence for, for more than three neutrinos. Here's photographic evidence of <laughs> three neutrinos. Um, you know that from the Z-naught width that one of them has to be sterile. Um, <laughs> and they're only three bucks. They only have to pay for the actor ones, a dollar each. So this is a, this is a, a, a very old poster that uh, I got from uh, Rocky Cobb, uh, a band that's in Seattle. I doubt they're actually working. So just as a, 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 a historical overview because I'm going to be talking about different kinds of, of sterile neutrino dark matter. And the, the whole search for this this kind of X-ray line was started from from uh, the sterile neutrino dark matter candidate because it was thought to be a one way of detecting it. Um, and so uh, there's been different permutations of sterile neutrinos as dark matter. Historically, um, the first actually was called sterile neutrinos, but actually what we would call now maybe super weak neutrinos in that they have weaker than weak interactions. So they are basically like a WIMP, uh, but they're weaker than, the weak, more weakly coupled than weak. So uh, they freeze out at some very early time and through whatever process get the right abundance to be the dark matter. This was referred to as sterile neutrinos in some review papers in the 1980s. Um, so they're not quite sterile though, they do have some uh, coupling and uh, currently sterile neutrinos are a different thing. Um, uh, sterile neutrinos as we know them today were really uh, defined by this paper by Scott Dulles and Larry Woodrow in 1993 um, that basically gave the sterile neutrinos no coupling uh, at all with the active uh, sector except through the mass generation mechanism of the neutrinos. And when you include the finite temperature effects of the early universe, you actually never couple these, these, these sterile neutrinos to the early universe plasma, and it doesn't leak and freeze out like this kind of dark matter uh, or wind dark matter. It 
freezes in, sometimes sometimes called freeze-in dark matter. It just gets produced just enough. Um, and uh, uh, it was shown by uh, Bill Sondra that the mass scale where these things are produced at the right abundance is actually KDB scale, which makes them warm dark matter, uh, given their, their velocity conversion, similar to that of, of the neutrinos. Uh, in 1999, when I was a grad student at UC San Diego, um, working with George Fuller, him and his postdoc, Zhang Dong Shi, showed that you could actually get uh, resonant production of sterile neutrino dark matter if there's a small but not negligible amount of lepton number in the universe. It's actually uh, the same kind of mechanism that produces the solar neutrino uh, problem solution, the, so the large mixing angle and small mixing angle solutions, now about to be large mixing angle solutions. It's really an uh, MSW mechanism that transfers uh, uh, neutrinos from uh, the active sector to the sterile, uh, sterile neutrinos. And they showed that uh, the, actually because of the uh, wide range of, uh, uh, sort of wider range of possibilities that you could get for production, and the fact that the resonance produces low momentum modes over that of high momentum modes, you can actually get the dark matter to be anything from warm dark matter to cold dark matter. They call it the cool dark matter. Never come on. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, what I, I got involved at, at roughly this point in 1998, 99, as a PhD student, uh, and sort of uh, looked at this as basically you know, uh, the same problem with just a new parameter, which is the lepton number of the universe, basically. The lepton number can be close to zero, and you get the double smoother case, and it could be larger, and you get resonant cases. And so we did, I did a precision calculation of this, and, and neither of these things actually dealt with the big uh, feature that exists during production, which is the core K-drawn transition. It just so happens that for both of these mechanisms, the transition from quarks and, and gluons above about 170 MeV in the universe uh, convert into hadrons, protons, neutrons, and other and ions and such uh, uh, at that transition. And that occurs exactly when this production is occurring. And so in order to get that production right, you sort of have to deal with the fact that you get enhanced scattering in a different thermal history during the, uh, the uh, and different time temperature evolution during that production. Too. And so to get that right, you sort of have to put that in. Um, uh, Exactly, and then what we also looked at is basically all the constraints, and uh, there were a lot of constraints uh, from the CMB, big bang nucleosynthesis, other things, but we found out that actually the best constraints would be X-ray detection in our local universe. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's what we, we looked at. And I revisited this back in 2005, because one of our founders sort of had a revival back in the mid-2000s, um, uh, uh, and did a more uh, precise calculation that point. So uh, in terms of particle physics, so this is a, like a particle physics slash um, cosmology talk. So in terms of the particle physics, uh, sterile neutrinos have arisen in a number of ways. Uh, so sort of the most uh, simple way is just to add Mariana and Dirac mass terms of comparable magnitude that allows you to have an uh, appreciable mixing between the, um, uh, the active neutrinos and the sterile neutrino uh, or enough. And you can actually, in this mechanism, also uh, give the atmosphere solar neutrino uh, mass splittings. You can't accommodate uh, the LS and D anomaly here for the you know, uh, neutrino side. Uh, so you would only have a sterile neutrino um, for the dark matter and two very massive ones to give you the mass splitting of the atmosphere uh, on solar scales. So it's actually more natural to not accommodate the LS and D uh, in this case. You can also get them in left-right symmetric models, sometimes known as mirror models. Um, they arise. Uh, you can also get them in higher dimensional operators and string-inspired models that Paul Langer pointed out some time ago. Um, and you can also get them as bulk fermions, so uh, uh, ABD-type fermions, so that you can, get, uh, you can actually get a, a solution, a vacuum solution of solar material problems, which is, of course, not, no, not, not to be correct. Um, uh, with uh, these large extra dimension models. And last but not least, if you're uh, a big supersymmetry uh, fan, um, they, you can actually get the Axido to act as the sterile neutrino in our parity violating MSSM and basically get the uh, uh, get a dark matter candidate in what else what uh, would be a non uh, stable limp scenario. Uh, so this is, this is sort of just a Hodgepodge of things uh, that, that 
could produce this candidate. And I'm sort of, I'm agnostic as to which of these is the best way of producing uh, mass mechanism. Um, one thing that we, what we found out in, in uh, about 2000, 2001, was that uh, if you produce these things, that product, production mechanism requires a, a mixing between the sterile and active states. And that mixing requires, uh, uh, by its very existence, a, a decay mode to exist. And this is a, a higher order decay mode. It's a loop, right? Uh, there's a tree level one that goes to three neutrinos that would be very hard to detect because it's three neutrinos. Um, here, you get a gamma. So you can actually see the photon uh, that comes off of the charged lepton here. And uh, this uh, heavier mass state, which is predominantly a sterile, that's why the sterile is in quotes here, it's really the mass eigenstate decaying. Um, uh, that heavy mass eigenstate decays into two relatively massless things. One that is exactly massless, and this one is almost massless. So it produces a photon at uh, half the mass of the sterile neutrino. And if you have a KEV scale thing, then you get a KEV scale photon, which is an X ray photon. So you should see this in X ray observations. The K rate is exceedingly small, 10 to the minus 28 of them per second. And I put in the parameters for uh, where the signal sits. Um, and the, the way that you win is partly because the, fifth, the, uh, the uh, decay rate goes to the fifth power of the mass. And you win astronomically as well because for something like the Virgo cluster or galaxies, if you take 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 solar masses of dark matter divided by KV, you get 10 to the 78 dark matter particles. So what does that mean? That means you get something of order 10 to the 48 or 10 to the 50 dark matter particles decaying every second. Okay, that's not just a macroscopic number; it's an astronomical number of decays, right? So you can actually detect that potentially in, a, in an X-ray telescope, a human-sized object, right? And so, so we showed this. Can back you just in, set the scale of the the time scale that you're talking about there? Uh, this one. Do it in my head, yeah. Uh, it's just because of the. the well, what's the life? So ballpark yeah. a lifetime of this thing is. Ten to the twenty-eight seconds. So, yeah. so the eight eight hours, eight 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 seconds. Yeah. So it's an yeah, astronomical so it's lifetime. Ten to the seven seconds per year. The universe is ten billion years old. So, ten to so in other words, there should just be a, a steady flux of these things. Right. There, it's not. It's not going away at any time. But the dark mat the amount of dark matter in the universe ought to have been steadily dropping. Right, by a very time. microscopic amount, actually. Just turn, I mean this 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 is ten orders of magnitude slower than the, the lifetime of the universe so far. So we've got like one ten one ten billionth of dark matter has gone away, something like that. I mean I'm just very roughly because you'd have to do this really with real relativity. But it's a very small fraction of decay, even though it decays relatively rapidly. And that's just because, partly it's because of this low mass scale. It's so it's a big number times a small so number leaves you with a lot, okay. Yes. is also a dark matter. So the dark matter going to dark matter. So it's, not... No, it's oh, not as... High, that's hot dark matter. But true. I mean, you're, you're not losing energy or anything like that. Right? But that's just a standard model neutrino on the right, correct? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but it's, it's, I mean, uh, hypothetically, it's got some mass, therefore it's hot dark matter. But again, this, this is a very uh, small fraction of things that's, that's leading to uh, uh, it's a very small fraction that's decaying in the end, but even though it's producing an astronomically viable and detectable system. Um, so we, we uh, uh, back in 2000, 2001, what uh, uh, Exima Newton and Chandra were just launched uh, about a year before, in 1999, and the first observations of the Virgo cluster were, were published by Boringer and uh, Exima Newton, and we used their data, and we didn't work, although I, we worked with an X-ray astronomer uh, I'm, I'm not an X-ray astronomer, I'm a theorist, and so I, although I, I've gotten to know statistics of my own, being, being involved with the Cylindrical Sky Survey and, and, and uh, um, data methods. Uh, at the time, I just did a, synth a synthesized spectrum uh, of Virgo, putting in its temperature and, and observed X-ray flux uh, into uh, web spec, uh, and uh, put a, a line of a sterile neutrino that would be 4 kV in that spectrum. And there, it's you know maybe statistically detectable, but you wouldn't be able to differentiate between this line, for instance, that easily. So, really, you don't have much of a strength here. But if the five kV thing, or if this goes up to the fifth power of the mass, you get a whopping signal, and there's no unidentified lines of that strength in the in the observations of Virgo. So we said, really, this there's an upper limit, uh, somewhere around five kV, that, that rough rough ballpark. 
to, these, uh, to this case. And so, uh, and this mass refers to the mass of the Dodos and Wittrow dark matter candidate. And uh, uh, that sort of became a, a, a figure of merit for uh, X-ray constraints. Okay, so where your X-ray constraints uh, hit the Dodos and Wittrow models uh, predictions uh, in mass and mixing in space. So basically there was a long list of different constraints. Ours, uh, that original 2001 one was superseded by this analysis by Alexei Fiorarsky. Uh, uh, actually when you do this, you this is correctly and get the flux the Virgo uh, uh, more accurately, about 6 kV. Yeah. This tail? Is that what you're asking? Uh, I don't know, and I'm not sure it's not instrumental. Uh, this is just pure count, so I'm not sure. It's got to be instrumental, but it's not being that bright. Yeah, I would guess it is. It's a Virgo extension. I don't know if it is or much faster. And so, yeah, so uh, these, these limits, uh, uh, this was, I think, in the original Barnica paper, and I've used this figure since then. Um, uh, so these, these uh, numbers sort of marched down, and the best ones up until 2011 were about the 2 kEV level. Now, this is for the Dodos and Woodrow mechanism, so if you plot that in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, Dodos and Woodrow uh, uh, mechanism in mass versus mixing angle space, it follows this line here where the lepton number is zero, and if you increase the lepton number, you can dig into uh, smaller mixing angles, smaller couplings, uh, because you get this enhanced convection mechanism. And so, uh, so we said we, we didn't stop with just our, our rough limit. We also looked at what could happen in the future. And back then, there was a uh, proposal for uh, an X-ray mission called Constellation X, which would be a uh, four or five telescopes with a much uh, effectively a much larger effective area than Chandra, and having microcalorimeters for X-ray spectroscopy. And would give you win two ways. You'd win with more effective area, more photons collected, and you would get much finer energy resolution, so you could pick out lines much easily, much more easily. Um, and so you could get this kind of sensitivity to the parameter space in, in gray, okay. uh, both from clusters and field galaxies. And uh, this, the first detection actually sits in this part of the parameter space uh, by Bilbul et al, and I'll say more about that. So that, that detection sits about there. And they actually used a method that we, we highlighted. We actually said, well, if you don't get Constellation X. You could get an exposure equivalent to this by stacking it uh, uh, with a stacking analysis of the spectra with a number of similar clusters as the Virgo. So, uh, so that was what they did, and um, this the parameter space is uh, looked like this before there was looking out again. So I, that 2001 figure was a bit uh, just a sort of a heuristic sketch. This is a more accurate calculation of the lepton number and zero lepton number collection scenario that I'd done in 2005, and this was in a white paper that I did in 2011. Basically, where all the constraints were uh, for the diffuse X-ray background, Andromeda, or some minor uh, Milky Way constraints, uh, cosmic X-ray background, this is from the Chandra Deep Field. Uh, interestingly, this this uh, uh, this region here, unresolved CXB, is from three megasecond observation um, uh, and from Chandra Deep Field. Uh, this star is from a 100 second observation from uh, the McCammon team with the sounding rocket flight. And that tells you the, uh, the importance of doing microcalorimetry and X-ray astronomy. It, you really win from, the, uh, from two things with that observation. It looked at much a large part of the sky, at about, uh, about a, a quarter of the sky covered in this field of view, plus, uh, uh, which is a lot of dark matter. Uh, plus, it uh, had microcalorimetry, which gave uh, you know, uh, EV scale uh, energy resolution. Could you explain the plot again? So you have mass of the star neutrino on the y-axis, right? Mixing angle on the x-axis, right? And so the blue the areas, areas are, are bad. And Where the yeah. lepton number of what? The lepton number here is in units of, of the photon number. So, um, so once you approach 0.1, you're getting an order of the photon number in asymmetry. Um, so the blue areas are excluded, the red areas are where the predictions lie, and there's sort of a free parameter of this lepton number, and the biggest, or the you know, biggest it can really be is about this scale. So anything within these red contours regions is allowed. Uh, 
uh, roughly. Okay? And where the limits are, uh, like the 2.2 e KEV limit that I showed, is basically where this region hits the red line, which is about 2.2 KEV. Um, but really, there's a second parameter other than the mass, which is the mixing angle, so you really have to show this full space. Um, so thanks. Thanks for letting me slow down and explain this. Um, so okay, so that's this is where things sat uh, as of a few years ago, and um, and uh, uh, this is where the signal sits right at the edge of these M31 constraints. These are actually the um, M31 constraints from 2011 from the Watson uh, and, and others uh, uh, analysis. Um, I think it would be. Uh, it's not the outer maker, yeah. it's uh, Boyarsky's uh, oh. Milky Way analysis. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is the, the, the stacking. So 13 years after we said you could stack clusters, somebody did it, they did it with 73 of them. Um, this is a six megasecond observation, so it's even a bit deeper really than when you add up the time, total time, it's, it's even deeper than the time you feel. And um, they found uh, that, that uh, there's an excess at about 3.5 or 3.55 KeV uh, that is consistent with the line given the instrument, instrumental resolution. So, um, you haven't explained to us the fit of the model, so how do we know the model is not incorrect here? Right, okay. Because so okay. Okay. Yeah. that seems like a very, very small effect. Right. Yeah, it does seem like a small effect. Um, this looks like it's not for four or five sigma, but um, you know these are uh, one sigma yeah. problems. But because um, yeah, I cannot fit a stellar spectrum to that accuracy, if I was if I tried to fill the stellar spectrum with everything I know about radio transfer, that this accuracy would, would probably be impossible for missing lines, for uncertainties in GF values, yeah. the abundance variations, there are all sorts of things that vary. Yeah, I'm going to get to this. Okay, this is the this is the this is the splash plot. And then I'll get to the problems. Um, yeah. So all right. So this is the, the signal, and uh, um, the first thing I did uh, when I got their paper, and, and I, just to say one other thing about the signal is the, the Esther uh team and collaborators are, are at the Chandra X-ray Science Center at Harvard, and if you know, as I as I said, I'm not an X-ray astronomer, um, uh, but I do follow in detail what's going on in, in Astronomy. If, if there was one group that I would want to look for this line, it would be them because they're X-ray astronomers and they're among the best. Um, Maxime Markevich, who I've, I work with with the Toronto Deep Field Analysis, is the second author of the paper. And anyway, I would say you know these aren't particle physicists that are dabbling in X-ray data, which often happens, uh, uh, or gamma ray data or something. They're actually astronomers that are doing the data. Um, so if I, you know if I was like uh, Global dictator, and I wanted somebody to work on it. It would be done, um, but I'm not interested anyway. So, uh, so where, what I did was I put their point on our later's paper. Uh, we had a paper in late 2013 looking uh, looking at the M31 data from Chandra with the X-ray astronomers there at Irvine, um, uh, Phil Humphreys, and, and uh, uh, it was the X-ray astronomer we worked with. He looked at the M31 data from Chandra, and we had this exclusion. And again, this is Douglas Woodrow space. Uh, uh, Shinsaku Hiroyuchi likes to look at it in terms of this space, so now we s uh, switched mass to be on the x-axis and mixing it to be on the y-axis, and most plots from here on out will be in this space. But anyway, so I plotted this uh, point, and it's right on our edge of our exclusion region. Okay. And I thought, wow, if we had a few more hundred kiloseconds around 31, and this is a real decay line, we would have seen it in the data. And then six days later, after the, the, the Boyarsky team, uh, came out, they saw it in Andromeda. Uh, and they saw it with Exxon Newton data, which had a, a, a bit more in time on, uh, on Andromeda than uh, Chandra. And they saw it at about the three sigma level uh, at the same energy. Yeah. So using a previous like plus substructure, where does, where does the substructure come in from later? Uh, so, uh, right, so I've sort of whited out the substructure constraint that sits here. And the thing is that there are structure constraints that are the gray regions here. And uh, what we did in our paper was entirely correct because we only looked at the Dodelson-Woodrow model and we were constraining the Dodelson-Woodrow model. In 
in general, these substructure constraints are very dependent on, on uh, the production mechanism of the neutrino. And in this case, it's not a double smoke or neutrino. It's sitting far away from the double smoke parameter. So, so by substructure, you mean like collective like substructure? With, right. That's, with, and I'll get to that. So okay. That's sort of where the implications are. Um, so it, this is not a double smoke or neutrino. It has to be something else. Um, or if it is a double smoke or it's only a small fraction of the total bump. Um, but, so, yeah, this is where it sits. There's not really a constraint necessarily on the, from the gray region on this part of the parameter space. Okay, that's why I sort of blotted out the, the constraint. Um, yeah, so, so this, this, is, this was seen in Andromeda next, so uh, I think this highlighted the interest in this because it was sort of seen by two independent groups, and, uh, and it turns out in five independent data, data sets. Um, Actually, depending on how you count it, it's also detected. It's detected. Did they use the same background so, model? Uh, they used very different uh, background models because this is not a cluster of galaxies. It's a, it's a field galaxy, right? It's a, it's a, uh, it's a Milky Way-like galaxy near us. Um, so they're predominantly the background here is, is the cosmic texture background of this this um, And there are a few lines above. Uh, three and, and, uh, in, in the spectrum. And, uh, Where are they coming from? Where are those solar lights or bumps This uh, There is like an argon feature here at about 3.1 or 2.2 kV that uh, uh, could be there in the, in the sort of warm, hot uh, bubble around our galaxy and Andromeda. Uh, but primarily the features here in counts are, are because of the instrument. Remember that just the counts as a convolution of the actual sure flux response. Um, so they saw, uh, so they saw that uh, the bull bullet al team saw this signal in stacked MOS uh, CCD data and PN CCD data, and uh, there's two different CCDs aboard Exxon and Newton that have different uh, properties, and different groups have decided to look at clusters with different CCDs depending on the goals, and they they found that. The, uh, the signal in both the MOS stack data and the PN data. And the signal is 4 to 5 sigma, depending on the, the continuum model. Um, it, uh, uh, they stacked clusters from 0.01 to 0.35 in redshift, and this sort of this blends features an instrument response that should hopefully reduces its influence on the presence of this line. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, remind me uh, how they get the background model. Is it uh, astrophysical model, or they actually look away from the galaxy? The, uh, well, there's two different things. There's the blank sky data, which tells you how the, how the telescope is being influenced by cosmic ray, and, 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 and all these things that affect the CCD response. Then there's also the, what's going on with the cluster, X-ray cluster itself, which is very bright in the X-ray, and so you actually have to make a, a model for that emission. So they, they do a multi-temperature model, and I'll say more about that, but uh, those observers that want to really hear um, and, uh, so, uh, so anyway, so they saw it in, at this level of significance, and the, the, reason, the fact that they saw it in two different independent data sets um, at the same position really means that trials factor, I say it's unnecessary, it's, it's still there, it's just very, very small, so you don't have to uh, penalize for the fact that you, uh, you're looking for a line in, in a wide range of data. Um, uh, this sometimes is called a look elsewhere. Um, they also saw it with, in uh, uh, about the two signal level with Chandra. Okay, but, um, they did not see it in Virgo, but this gives a rough, basically a roughly consistent upper limit with the other data. Uh, Boyarsky, the Boyarsky team um, uh, saw it in Andromeda, as I said, they also, with exon Newton data. They also saw it in Perseus at about the same level of significance with uh, exon Newton data. So there's basically here, there's five independent data sets from two different groups. That's why I think at least I got started being very interested in this. Um, there was a, a follow-up analysis towards Black and Center by the Boyarsky team that showed that there is an excess at uh, three and a half keV um, that you cannot say is a, is a, is a, is a definitely dark matter, but what you you can't uh, because the the galactic center this is the Milky Way galactic center has uh, you know hundreds of extra point sources. It has hot gas. It has 
uh, uh, X-ray emitting gas. It has uh, uh, a lot of stuff going on. You cannot model it from a priori, unlike a, a galaxy cluster. It's it, in some ways galaxy clusters, galaxies are simpler these because they have just this very large reservoir of extra gas. Um, uh, so uh, what you what you can look at though is to see if this is consistent with what has been seen before. So since you know the position of uh, the line in, in the energy space, you know the mass of the dark matter particle that you have to produce it, you can actually get rid of that in your analysis and fix it. And then look at line flux versus the projected mass density on the sky and see if it's consistent with what, what's been detected. And here in Perseus and M31, and there are uncertainties in projected mass density and flux. And then uh, extend this to what turns out to be a much higher projected mass density, which is the black in the center. And the line is detected at, in this box. Uh, so it's actually uh, that 3.5 kV line that's detected in the black in the center is actually consistent with being a dark matter decay. It doesn't mean it is, it just means it's consistent. It's, you know, there's certainly atomic lines in this thing that can produce it there. So what metal lines? Okay, so um, so uh, this is this gets to, to, to the question about uh, the analysis, really. What, what is the continuum model that's being used and why can't there just be some unknown atomic line or known atomic line that produces it? Um, so unknown unknowns are tough, right, because of the those are very difficult to quantify. They're unknown. But known unknowns are quantifiable, and among those are potassium argon uh, lines that would sit at about this energy. And you can look at what their emissivity is, their line flux is, at a given plasma temperature uh, based uh, from the uh, atom to heat database. And among the people on the, the uh, this is a figure from the Bull Bull uh, 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 team paper. Uh, among the people on there were Randall Smith and others that are experts in this atomic database, and David goes into it. And uh, basically, if you look at these emissivities, the best one that could get there is maybe argon uh, 17. It's still off by a factor of a few or several, and the plasma temperature has to be fairly low. Okay. Uh, there's potassium lines also that could be here, and the, the Bull and Al team looked at that carefully. Um, Again, at low plasma temperatures, they peak at the highest emissivities, and but still things are off by a factor of 10 to 20. Okay. But you haven't told us how, how accurate the abundances are for these elements in the, in the gas. I don't know the abundance of argon in the sun to a very high accuracy. So how do you know what the, the natural abundance is in this gas? It could be off by a factor of two. Right. Unless you have other lines that, that you can fit. Right. And plus the, the GFI can also your strengths aren't known to okay. low flow. Yeah, but still, I mean, right. So you, we don't know the we don't know the oxygen abundance in the sun to better than about 0.2 dex. Right. But do you know the potassium abundance in a, in a cluster to better than a factor of 10? I don't know. I would say they they argue that you know it better than a factor. Now, but they do actually let the potassium flux to be. I mean, it's a 26 page long, page long paper, so they did a lot of stuff in it. And among the things, they actually let the potassium flux, uh, abundance be completely arbitrary. And if you do that, the the line actually goes away, the 4 to 5 sigma uh, detection goes away, but you still get an excess of about 1 to 2 sigma, because the, this, these energies don't match the excess uh, well. I mean, they don't match an energy exactly. So if you, if you do say, I don't know anything about the abundance, the flux goes, the, can go way up, then you, you basically, the problem is that uh, the, pers the Perseus data and the X-ray cluster data really want a few keV in temperature. And there it becomes not an order of magnitude problem, but it becomes, uh, you know, a factor of 10, it becomes more than that. It becomes a factor of 20 or 30 or, or 100 problem. Um, so, but you can still give up on knowing the abundance. I, I fully agree, and they, they talked about that, and then the, the, the line goes away, and they say that. So, uh, the question is, can you get a consistent X-ray plasma model in abundance, temperature, uh, and still, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, still have that line or not? And then the answer is in a, in a consistent multi temperature plasma model, you cannot produce that line with a reasonable set of abundances for that. Okay. So that's that's really what they're doing. Um, one comment I want to make <coughs> when I first heard about the three and a half keV, that's like, you know, in the dark matter field, that's the well known line, that, line that's 
Oh, oh, so that on the dumb. Yeah, that three and a half key, that's what the potential mark is. So the way we do in dark matter, the way you wish they could actually do that on their X-ray setup, the three and a half key in potassium would actually always come with the one and a half in a B cap. So if they could tag that, they could actually constrain what fraction is done on the X. But I don't know if that, you know, that can be done after this, but so you know to it. You would have to not use Chandra for that, though, or right. you would have to design yeah. something for that. I mean, there are some experiments that measure that energy that they currently find. And the thing that's at that level is a Comtel. Comtel, yeah. So it's, that's, it was, it was, yeah, not to find that. Um, so I think, I mean, the, the conclusion is, is that most lines at this energy were too low in flux for the typical cloud temperatures that are involved in these things. And some of these lines are constrained by other. Uh, partner lines that would come with, for instance, argon 17 here would actually come come to, uh, along with an argon uh, 17 triplet line that would have a, a much higher flux by a factor of 100. And when you uh, include that, the constraint on that partner line, uh, the argon 17 uh, DR line, DR combination line, would actually have a flux that's a factor of 32 low. So there's both of these things. And you can actually use the same argument for chlorine lines. So if you, if you look at what's going on with the chlorine, uh, emission that also could exist at this energy. They don't even include it because the line alpha of that process is constrained much, uh, much more greatly than the line beta that's in this energy. So, uh, is there a consistent picture uh, in terms of is there basically the line flux consistent with being from dark matter? If you plot this, if you assume it's uh, due to dark matter, and then see what the uh, decay rate is, which is proportional to this mixing angle, then they within scatter, I would say that this, there's a consistent picture. Okay. Um, these are 90% errors, so you know maybe there's a two sigma uh, tension here, but it's not it's not very strong. Um, and importantly, the Perseus data, which is this uh, blue data uh, and purple data, is among the higher highest in the flux. So a lot of the follow-up analyses sort of look at how bright this line is in Perseus and it constrain how bright that outline is in Perseus saying that it's not seen. But it's not clear that that is the best estimate for how bright this line should be. Um, in fact, this is only a two sigma detection. It could be an upper fluctuation. The, the five sigma detection is the full sample MOS data, which is this red pen. So um, uh, also uh, here, basically, there, there is a constraint that was our work uh, at, uh, at UC Irvine from M31. Uh, that is this dashed line. Okay, so there's already, a, uh, this is a, I think our 95% contour uh, will basically excludes everything uh, to the right of it. So there's tension already in the in existing data. And as this is, mind you, this is better than any of the Virgo cluster uh, non-detection. So, uh, so there's a lot of follow-up uh, uh, preprints and comments and so on. I'm just gonna give a brief rundown on this stuff. Uh, there's a, a bananas potassium paper uh, by uh, Totema Profumo. They called into question the bulb one variety results. They said that the galactic center uh, excess uh, observations uh, exclude uh, a dark matter interpretation of the line. And the way they did this was they actually assumed all of the 3.5 kV flux in the galactic center was coming from potassium 18, subtracted that from the data, and then placed a constraint on any dark matter decay after doing that subtraction of the potassium line. So that line that I showed you earlier, they fit as a potassium 18 line, subtracted from the data, got a new data set, and said, now I'm going to place constraints on dark matter, which I, I think, like, scientific 101 methodology precludes you from doing that, because you have an exact degeneracy between these lines. But anyway, based on that analysis, they said it's inconsistent. Uh, and then they also looked at the uh, M31 data. They said that there's less than two sigma evidence in the exome new data of the Andromeda uh, line. And in fact, they, the, the Boyarski team showed that the uh, JP M31 analysis was flawed because they used a very narrow en energy range. It's wider than the energy line width, but when you uh, allow for the data, uh, you exclude the uh, other data which constricts uh, the continuum, you basically are allowing the flux within the narrow band to go up and down and reduces the significance of the presence of that line in that window. Um, so that is the problem. Right? And then uh, they also said that uh, the line ratios of the cluster data 
basically show that it's not, uh, it's, you could get a consistent model for it, uh, you could get a consistent emission of potassium uh, uh, line flux uh, in a uh, uh, multi temperature model uh, for the, uh, for the uh, Perseus data. Meaning that basically, uh, if you just argue for how bright certain lines should be at certain ratios, you can actually get a bright potassium line at low temperatures, which was already shown in the previous plot that I showed. So if you don't see it in a cluster like further, and doesn't that mean that it can't be the potassium background? I mean, uh, what do they argue? Like, you know, well, every, every cluster here, should be. Like, it could be an instrumental effect or potassium or something. But if you don't see in one, you can see the other one. Well, each cluster has a different temperature so and different abundance of elements. So it's, it's not clear that you would have the same potassium line strength. But you should have the same dark matter line strength. So if you're excluding, you know, if you, if you have a low flux in one and not the other, it, it's completely consistent with the atomic picture because you have different temperatures and different abundances. But in dark matter picture, if you have a good estimate for the dark matter within an optic, it shouldn't happen. Um, so I, I'm going through this quickly, but basically they, they argued for this, uh, this line ratio analysis to show that you could actually get a bright potassium line. But they didn't actually do any modeling. No, no, the Bobel team actually did multi-temperature uh, x-ray gas modeling of the clusters to constrain the abundances and the temperature of the uh, x-ray continuum simultaneously because the, the strength of the lines depends on the temperature of the continuum that you get is a function of the extra gas temperature. So the Jotama Profumo didn't actually do any modeling, they just argued by line ratios, and then Volvold showed that the line ratios they used were incorrect, and actually changes the conclusions that you would draw from that kind of argument. I can go into that more after we're done if people are interested. Um, there's another follow-up. This is actually something we considered doing at, at, at uh, Irvine. Uh, was uh, uh, stacking uh, observations of galaxies, and this was done by the by Anderson, Traza, and Bregman. They took uh, 81 galaxies from Chandra and 89 galaxies of Exxon and Newton uh, using just the outskirts, mass in the centers, parts of the galaxies. And they said that uh, uh, the 3.5 kV line had a fixed mixing angle uh, uh, of bulbs uh, is excluded by almost 12 sigma. And uh, if you actually look at the paper instead of the abstract, uh, you see that this plot exists, which is the mixing angle, and units of 10 to the minus 10, and the neutrino mass here. And this is their continuum uh, for the exon Newton stack, the continuum residual, which is this here. Okay. So this is them modeling their stacked observations with the continuum, and these are the residuals of the continuum model. And uh, so they said, well, our systematic uncertainty of the continuum is bracketed by this uh, red envelope. But we're going to quote not the systematic uncertainties, we're going to quote the statistical uncertainties. And if you count the statistical uncertainty deviations from this point, which is a negative, right, it's the downward fluctuations from the center of this point, that's 12 sigma. Again, I, this is like scientific methods 101, you don't ignore your systematic uncertainties. And in that, if you do uh, take them into account, it's not clear that these points are inconsistent with that systematic band. Um, so, uh, they don't quote a flux limit on this line because they can't quote a flux limit on this line okay? because they're dominated by systematic uncertainty. All right, so uh, that's what I said there. Um, all right, there's also a stacking of dwarf galaxies, which is a, this is actually one of the better follow-up analyses. Yeah, this is by Malashev and company. They stacked eight dwarf galaxy data uh, with by Exxon Newton, about 408 kilosecond observation, which is quite nice. The bulbal detection for Perseus detection plus is here. Um, and their exclusion with an optimistic dwarf galaxy masses in light green and, and pessimistic in dark green. If you zoom in on that region, uh, you notice that this detection is here. Again, this is sort of the brighter line flux. Um, the dashed line is our uh, M31 analysis from 2013. Uchi et al. It actually does better than the dwarfs right at the line position. Okay, and this is even our 95% contour compared with their 90%. Uh, so ours is actually even better. Yeah. So 
Um, uh, there's another follow-up analysis uh, by the Suzaku, uh, uh, people familiar with Suzaku data, looking for it in Perseus, and they did see the line in Perseus in, in the core, okay, and they see it outside the core. They uh, speculate that the profile of that line is inconsistent with dark matter, but it's not really clear how inconsistent it is. Uh, and they also don't detect it uh, at the same flux in Coma, uh, Virgo, and Ophigius. I don't know. Um, uh, they don't detect it, and uh, uh, it's not clear uh, why it's not, uh, you know, why it's not detected. But they don't really. Uh, Suzaku has a, a poor uh, spatial resolution, and um, so you actually get a lot more point source contamination into the continuum uh, because, say, you're not able to mask out your point sources as well. Uh, Tamora et al. actually, uh, as a Japanese team. Uh, very familiar with Suzaku um, that looked at Perseus and they, they didn't see this the same line as Urban. Uh, actually, Louis on this paper and I sent a detailed email yesterday with my comments. So it's the ringing. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I, I just highlighted some of these things and I think you know I'm glad that there's a lot of follow up. It's not clear how consistent or inconsistent this data is with the detection because yet again there's no actual line flux limit from this data and I'd love to see it because. Um, there's line flux limits that do exist. This is the one from the Tamora paper from Suzaku. This is now a mixing and versus mass in this parameter space. The Perseus limit is it's there. Uh, there's the stack door for instance, the arm, the cluster detection, the MOS cluster detection is there, and the M31 detection is pink. Okay. Our uh, Uriuchi Andromeda limit remains. It, it predict, you know, it pre timed. It was earlier than the detection, but it remains the best. Uh, limit in this part of the space. Uh, these are all 90% confidence limits. And one, two, and three sigma for the signal. So I, you know, uh, it's not, you know, although there's tension between these limits and the data, you can't say that the limits are uh, excluding it entirely. You really want to get to the, like down here kind of exclusion. So uh, now the implications for the last 10 minutes uh, of, the, of the data. So this is our um, Parameter space from the uh, from 2013 paper, and we have these uh, constraints from substructure. Okay? And this constraint is the most stringent. It's the counts of subhalos as you see them in dwarf galaxies in M31. M31 has a lot more dwarf galaxies than our own Milky Way uh, does, and uh, it actually places a strong constraint on on the warmness of the dark matter as a result. And, and it sits about here, 8.8 kV for the dotals and Woodrow case. And there's a big asterisk on, on this. Uh, when you put this data point on here, you have to put this asterisk, and Alex Kosenko is like, you shouldn't even put any constraints on here. Uh, the asterisk is that this constraint depends on this production mechanism and not, does not apply to the full parameter space. Um, so in interest, interest of time, I'm going to skip production. I'll wait. Uh, the part of the business we want. So in this resonant production scenario, uh, what happens is that in the sheet fuller mechanism, you actually produce the low momentum modes, this is energy over temperature, momentum over temperature. Uh, the resonance moves from low to high momentum. And once you deplete the lepton number, you no longer produce the sterile neutrino. And you produce predominantly low momentum modes, which allows it to be colder than a, something that produces a, a, the neutrinos across the spectrum, which is really the double cylindro mechanism across the spectrum, so you get a, just a suppressed thermal spectrum. And it's, uh, the, the, um, this uh, matter-effective mixing really has its own uh, matter-effective mixing angle, and you get a resonance uh, when this term goes to, the, goes to zero, and you get uh, maximal mixing. So when you get maximum, you find where that maximal mixing is, that's the position of resonance and momentum spaces, or momentum and of functions. Uh, and that position is the 3.6 in momentum over temperature, or energy over temperature. Uh, it's at 3.65 at a temperature of 170 V for a 7 kV neutrino and a lepton number that you need to produce all of the dark matter. Why does that matter? Well, 3.6 kV, or 3.6 for a 7 kV thing would sit right about here, right in the middle of the distribution. And 
Uh, that is where the resonance is during the quark hadron transition. Okay, so you really the, the quark hadron transition affects what how this thing is produced uh, greatly. And both and this lepton number is really going to change how things uh, behave. So this is this is a paper I wrote shortly after the detections, basically exploring this parameter space uh, in detail using the analyses that I did back in 2005 for ac uh, accurate ca calculations of uh, dark matter in this parameter space. So uh, the purple region is that cluster of the MOS signal data, uh, which is the, the best, best detected line. Uh, the M31 limit uh, from Maria J. Al is the green. Uh, the lepton number that you need to produce this dark matter at the right abundance is uh, the contours here, okay, so, and, and these are in units of 10 to the minus 3. Uh, sorry, 10 to the minus 4, so this would be 10 to the minus 3. And um, so uh, these, every, every single point in this parameter space has uh, some model that produces the right abundance, but I only looked at five of them. Those are those five stars. And uh, they produce the following momentum distributions for the neutrinos. Okay, so you get these very low momentum distributions for these two cases, and then uh, for these cases, you actually need a smaller lepton number, so the, the, the resonance occurs later um, and uh, produces a different momentum distribution. For the same, exactly, these are all 7.14 KEV dark matter models. Okay. So uh, these are the central model cases. And what this is tied to is this fourth galaxy problem that, that many of us worked on, at least worked on. Uh, and uh, if you, if you uh, this is an old paper, old, old newspaper article from 2011, where um, maybe cosmologist Carlos Strank spoke of disturbing developments. And if you read further, it's keeping them up at night. Um, and that is this the fact that uh, the num not only the number of dwarfs doesn't match the local group necessarily in, in CDM, but their density profiles don't match. And uh, uh, this is uh, related to the, the fact whether there's cores or cusps, CDM wants uh, the central slope to be uh, minus one, but the data seems to favor something else. Uh, also in clusters of galaxies, it seems the central slope is lower than, than one. Uh, and um, uh, something that's been around for a long time, but it's probably solved by galaxy formation is the missing, missing satellites problem. And that is, we have many, many satellites in a CDM simulation, sort of like halos, but only a few of order 10 very bright fourth, fourth galaxies that are on our way. Um, but you can solve that by saying only those very bright things are populated by very bright, meaning very uh, massive subhalos are populated by, by stars. And then you get a, a good abundance matching between the two. Uh, the remaining problem is that once you look at try to uh, light up those very massive and dense things, it looks like actually the velocity, uh, the circular velocity of dwarf galaxies doesn't match uh, that of bright uh, or most dense uh, subhalos, okay. and so that's called the too big to fail problem. Uh, named, you know, shortly after the, the Great Recession started. Uh, uh, so anyway, so this is a this is where the uh, the data sits in the circular velocity versus uh, what you're measuring that circular velocity space, um, and these things don't light up. So that's that's a, that's a problem, and pro probably a large uh, part of this is is affected by the presence of baryons, which will actually uh, blow out gas and actually reduce the central density of the dark matter as well. This probably works for 10 to the few times 10 to the 6 or so more in stellar mass okay, that the, the, can reduce the density. But uh, these small uh, galaxies that have uh, low stellar mass can't have as much feedback by just because they don't have as much stellar activity. And it's not clear if these things still are too dense uh, you know, relative to what, what is observed, um, then that seems like maybe dark matter is the only way of getting this. Okay. Um, so um, that's sort of an open problem. And one of the solutions could be that you have more dark matter alleviating this to be the dead problem. Instead of circular velocity, this is just, which is a proxy for mass, they directly show mass here versus radius. Uh, so I'm just going to skip this.
So <clears throat> this is not my work. This is another paper uh, by the University of Zurich group doing galaxy formation in uh, late 2012. They looked at CDM plus warm dark matter plus mixed warm plus cold dark matter simulations. And uh, their conclusion was the following. It says, it seems that only pure warm dark matter model with a 2 kV thermal particle is able to match all the observations of Milky Way satellites. The total satellite elements, their radial distribution in, in, the, in the Milky Way uh, group, and their mass profile, which is a, another way of calling the two big scale problem. So this is, this is the warm dark matter case. Basically, the curves dispersion of curves matches the dispersion of the data as opposed to here. Uh, this is also one of the numbers. Um, so, and, and I just took basically those, those the model cases that we saw before and uh, found uh, how they match to a warm dark matter thermal particle. Now, remember I'm talking about a thermal warm dark matter particle which is produced in a different way from the donald Saavedra case and the, the resonant case. So to do the match, you actually have to see how they affect structure formation uh, in linear structure, which is just the transfer function relationship between warm dark matter and TDM. So this, uh, this you do by basically adding a fourth neutrino to, uh, uh, to CAM and then seeing what happens. And it's basically just uh, following the perturbation and evolution equations. So um, these are the three model cases that match to these central three model cases in green, gold, and red. And if you uh, calculate the transfer function, you get the green, golden, and red transfer functions. And uh, the uh, middle one here, the golden one, is a 2 kV. And you know it's not exactly in the center of this contour, uh, contours, but it's within these uh, uncertainties. Um, so I thought that I was an interesting coincidence that there may be some, some problem or some resolution to local group problems by a, the the sort of um, off-the-shelf uh, model for uh, sterile chain dark matter producing it. Um, okay, so just uh, just uh, quickly, I'm going to just say that there's actually the best constraints on the lower end of the thermal particle and mass, uh, lower dark matter mass, is about the 1.7 kV level from basically just counting the number of uh, uh, satellite galaxies in, in, in 31. Note this still allows that to be the case. And right now we're actually running simulations of resonant models, the L7, and L46, and L8 cases. And basically they fall, they tend to have circular velocity dispersions, uh, you know, distributions that are consistent with the local group dwarfs, which is sort of uh, consistent with the previous data. Another way of looking at it is uh, the number of subhalos. So you need to have to match the number of F31 dwarf galaxies, which is this number, but you want to reduce the number of too big to fail massive failures, and uh, there's sort of a range of subhalos plus failures in this blob, and uh, it uh, gets reduced in terms of both the number of subhalos and massive failures, but you can match the M31 abundance and, and basically get maybe only one massive failure, which in the Poisson case is, is pretty okay. So, uh, so there's these different challenges, and it seems that the 7 kV case could probably fulfill them. Um, the, uh, uh, the sort of wish list of, of what, where this is going to go is that the Astro H mission, which should be launched late this year, will have 4 EV, 4.4 EV energy resolution in X ray, uh, great calorimetry uh, X ray uh, spectroscopy. Uh, you would actually see the dispersion, the velocity uh, dispersion of the dark matter in the 3.5 kV line. That not see in the atomic line. So that would be a, a sort of a smoking gun feature between the two, which I think, you know, I think the Perseus is an obvious thing for an X-ray telescope to look at anyway, so I think it will be done. Uh, we had a proposal for doing this in Chandra uh, to get uh, a discovery of 10 megaseconds of observation, but you sort of lose because asteroid H will happen before you have 10, 10 megaseconds on asteroid on Chandra. Um, and so I'll that basically you can get this kind of limit as well. So win-win, either you completely exclude the signals uh, by an order of magnitude, or uh, or uh, you um, um, would detect it. All right. So uh, another thing you can do is a flux profile of the line, which uh, seems to be consistent with the higher least square the analysis. And the last thing you could do is look for it in King searches in nuclear beta decay. Uh, there's a lot of activity for the older 
particle physicists. You may remember the 1780 neutrino activity in the early 80s. That's why there's searches for it in nuclear beta decay here. And there's actually a proposal to search for it in the latest generation nuclear beta decay experiment, CATRA, which is doing a kinematic uh, electron neutrino mass measurements. You can get to 10 to the minus 8 in this angle at the 7 kV scale. <coughs> but remember, a few times 10 to the minus 10, so we're two orders of magnitude away from that, unfortunately. Um, there are production mechanisms that would sit in this part of the parameter space. For instance, if you only had, if you had a dorsal with your neutrino, you would actually have get an order of magnitude brighter flux, uh, uh, well, the same flux, but you have an order of magnitude bigger mixing angle because uh, you would actually need uh, uh, the same brightness from a smaller fraction of the dark matter. Okay. So if it's uh, basically, you would only produce about 15% of the dark matter to be uh, the dorsal with your dark matter in this parameter space. So you'd actually be only maybe a factor of 10 away if things were just, which is very interesting. All right, so uh, I'll just leave my conclusions up uh, some little over time. Thanks. Proposed it. I, I, I'm not. I don't disagree with the reviewers that uh, it's not a good time for Chandra to do that. Um, although, you know, I mean, as a particle physicist, I sort of coming from particle physics more than astrophysics. Maybe I mean, my view is maybe Chandra's done everything he can do in the astro. Maybe he should just be a dedicated dark matter detector at this point. But I, I don't know. I don't think any expert is Chandra. Right? For the accounts limit? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's uh, it's complete, um, but also it just has more dwarfs, right? So it's also it's probably slightly more massive. It's probably slightly more massive, but that's that we take a wash that into account. So I mean, it, it does have much. Uh, it just has like a factor of three more dwarfs. So uh, there's nothing else, so thanks. Uh, thank you. Yeah.